Hello, good evening, Noswaitha. Hope you're all well. A very interesting question uh, came up this week. Uh, in general, asking about the Welsh triads. Now, that's not some Welsh secret society of crooks. Uh, the Welsh triads are mnemonic devices that were used by the Welsh bards. Usually they involved um, names of important characters, but they could also cover all kinds of information, really. But when I'm talking about the Welsh triads in terms of the Welsh bardic tradition, what I'm really talking about uh, is this type of thing. So this is a pretty famous example of a Welsh triad. Tri hael yn ysprydain, nid hael mab senillt, mordaf hael mab serwan, Rhyder chael mab tidwel tidglid ac arthur ei hun oedd heilach nor tri, which translates as three generous, which could also mean noble or victorious men of the island of Britain. Nid the generous, son of Senilt, Mordav the generous, son of Serwan, Rhyderch the generous, son of Tidwell Tidglid, and then we can assume at a later date the uh, the famous Arthur has been inserted into the triad as well, and Arthur himself was more generous than the three. Now, this is actually quite a famous triad in the Welsh Bardic tradition. Many poets uh, used this triad when they were praising their patrons. So they would say things like, you are as generous as these three paragons of generosity uh, uh, these three legendary patrons of the past who were supremely generous not only to their bards but also to their families and their communities uh, and this was a triad that was used for several hundred years in the Welsh Bardic tradition there are um, versions of it from the 12th century all the way through up into the 15th, 16th century. And even today, uh, some Welsh bards will make reference to this triad of the most generous men of Wales. But here, of course, it's the most generous men of the islands of Britain. Because the triads that uh, were used by the medieval Welsh bards in particular weren't the triads of Wales, they were the triads of Britain. Uh, and they talk of Britain as one sovereign united island. We'll go and look at that in a bit more detail in a minute. I just want to give you one other example of um, a Welsh triad. So very similar in many ways, again naming three legendary, almost certainly mythological characters here. I mean mythological in the modern sense now, not in that they are gods, but they are evoking certain morals, uh, values and ethics uh, that have to do with Welsh society. So, tri forst cad yn ysprydain, dynawd mab pabo pos prydain, a gwallawg mab lleanawg a chynfelin drusgol. Three pillars of battle of the island of Britain. Dinaud, son of Pabo, pillar of Britain, and Gwallaug, son of Llianaug, and Kinvelin, the clumsy, perhaps Druskul there, could mean leprous as well. So instead of three paragons of generosity, we have here three paragons of war, three great warriors who are pillars of battle, unmovable. Now what's interesting about this triad in particular is that it's more than likely referring to real historical figures from the past. Gwallaug, interestingly enough, was almost certainly a king uh, in the Old North. Gwallaug, of course, is one of the noblemen or one of the chieftains or kings that the historical Taliesin praised all the way back in the 6th century. So Gwallaug obviously was um, a historical king of some renown. His uh, kingdom was probably in Elved. Uh, I think that that's uh, current day Yorkshire. Uh, and he's mentioned as a historical uh, figure in the Historia Britonum, which was copied down, I think, in the 8th century. So Gwallaug, almost certainly a historical figure, who develops into this legendary character who becomes renowned in later Welsh culture uh, as a great hero, a great warrior. And we can 
say that that's probably the case with many of the figures that we find in the Welsh triads. Uh, there's around 80 uh, in total that we would consider as triads of the island of Britain, triads of this type in particular, triads that mention uh, paragons of generosity or bravery or beauty or the best three artisans of this craft or that craft. Uh, three renowned legendary figures that sort of stand for um, a particular aristocratic value in many ways. They represent a particular aspect of aristocratic society, not only in Welsh medieval society, but traditionally in perhaps the Welsh society uh, of post-Roman Britain, and perhaps also of Celtic society in general before the Romans turned up. So they belong to this very ancient culture. Now, the triads of the island of Britain are only one type of triad. Rachel Bromwich, who was um, a renowned Welsh scholar who was responsible for editing and uh, researching the, the triads of the island of Britain, had this to say, uh, about Trioedd and Ysprydain. Trioedd and Ysprydain, the triads of the island of Britain, are distinguished by this title from the mass of triadic literature which has come down in medieval Welsh. The triad form was used as a means of cataloguing a variety of technical information. In addition to Trioedd and Ysprydain, Triads are used extensively in the legal codes, in technical treaties on medicine, and are found in the 14th century grammar of Union of Feiriad, where the trioid care of the triads of poetic craft deal with the details of poetic craftsmanship. Uh, I'll be taking a closer look at these trioid care of later on. These are triads that deal uh, specifically with the training of apprentice bards. Now, as you can see there, Rachel Bromwich is essentially saying that the triad, organising valuable knowledge into threes, was something that Welsh culture did over an extended period of time. It's obviously an aspect of the oral tradition of medieval Wales. We'll touch on some features of triadic formations in Celtic culture in general uh, later on also. But it's worth bearing in mind at this point that this is quite a common way of preserving and memorising knowledge. Many of the texts that have come down to us from this period, even though we find them written down, the vast majority of them would have existed in some form or another uh, in a purely oral form. They were purely um, artefacts of the memory and of the voice. These are the two important mediums of this culture. And of course, organising things into threes makes them easy to remember. Rachel Bromwich also had this to say. The four branches of the Mabinogi, Kiloch Akolwen, and the Welsh romances, these are essentially the classics of medieval Welsh literature, the great prose classics that have been translated several times, but more recently by uh, such great scholars as Seanad Davis. Rachel Bromwich there is essentially saying that these stories represent relatively late literary adaptations. So roughly speaking, these stories would have been copied down onto a manuscript between 1,000 and 800 years ago. And these represent relatively late literary adaptations, written adaptations, of what must be regarded as a mere fragment of the cycles of narrative to which they belong. Rachel Bromwich won't be the first, and she certainly won't be the last, to note that what we have in a collection such as the Mabinogion is a mere fragment of a greater body of oral law and literature that would have um, been passed on from generation to generation from the Dark Ages, uh, the early medieval period, all the way through the medieval period and perhaps even uh, into the early modern period. Uh, and at different times, these texts, poems, stories, lineages, histories, law would have been written down. Now, Trioid and Ispradain, I'm in the middle of the quote now, Trioid and Ispradain consisted in an index to this body of orally preserved narrative. 
formed for the benefit of those whose professional duty it was to preserve and hand on the stories which embodied the oldest traditions of the Britons about themselves. Now, Rachel Bromwich there is referring, of course, to the original Britons, the Welsh, Brythoniaid, yeah? Brythonic being the general Celtic language that many of the Celtic languages in Britain evolved out of. So that's what Rachel Bromwich means when she says the early Britons, i.e. the early Welsh. Um, that culture that uh, survived through the Roman occupation uh, and survives into the early medieval period and, the, and becomes the Welsh uh, around the three, four, five, six hundreds. So Rachel Bromwich there is pointing out that the the trioid that we have, the triads that we have, uh, make up an index for use by bards and also professional law keepers, which in Wales were called the Cavarwithiaid. Shona Davis uh, in particular has researched and explored this concept of the Cavarwid. Uh, a Cavarwid essentially translates as someone who uh, knows but also someone who can give direction uh, and particularly perhaps someone who can tell stories. Uh, so we have these law keepers, the Kavarwidyaid, and we also have the bards who may at times have also been considered law keepers in the more general sense of a Kavarwid. We're not really sure what the relationship between a bard and a Kavarwid was the bard, of course, was a professional poet, primarily, also an educator, but also someone who made great use of oral traditional knowledge. And then we have the Kavarwith, which may have been a more general class of law keeper that didn't just specialise in poetry, uh, but also preserved stories, genealogies, medical knowledge, all the different types of oral knowledge that a, a society such as medieval Wales would have needed to persist and survive and organise itself around. So the triads as an index to this oral body of law presents a tantalising glimpse at what this wider body of law may have looked like. Now when we look at some of these triads, for example when we go back to look at some of these characters here. That last character there, Kinvelin the Clumsy. All we really know is that Kinvelin was a legendary hero. We don't really know what Kinvelin's story was. We can kind of tease out what Gwallaug's story may have been. Gwallaug is certainly mentioned in uh, various other medieval uh, texts and stories. Dinaud, we're not really sure who Dinaud was either. He is mentioned in other places too, but um, not so frequently as Gwallaug. Then we look at Nidhail and Mordavhail and Rhyderhail, these paragons of generosity. We don't really know much about these uh, men either. We may know something of Rhyderch, but not much about Mordav or Nid. So, Many of these characters we don't know much about. Some of them are alluded to in other texts. Some of them uh, are main characters in some of the stories that have survived. But many of them are unknown to us, suggesting that there is this vast body of story that is missing, uh, that's been forgotten uh, over the generations. Now, it's also worth noticing this term tradition. Because what Rachel Bromwich concluded was that the triads commemorate the traditions of the island of Britain as a whole. Around the 12th century, the Welsh were essentially living in what we know today as Wales. But the triads referred back to an earlier period in Welsh history where there was no Wales, there was no England, there was no Scotland, perhaps, there was no Cornwall. There was simply the island of Britain. And what Rachel Bromwich says is that they look back upon the essential and still ideal sovereign unity of the island. Now, of course, Welsh legend tells us that at least in the medieval period, the Welsh believed that they were the rightful owners of the whole island of Britain and that the English were just latecomers to the party uh, and who had nicked big chunks of the island off them. 
So this golden age was very important in medieval Welsh culture and it was important for a very long period of time. We find hints of this golden age where the Welsh reigned supreme in Britain uh, mentioned uh, more or less throughout the whole of um, medieval Welsh literature. Rachel Bromwich summarises it like this. The story of the violation of this unity is brought into full relief in the Welsh triads. Max and Ledig, Maximus, who was perhaps a historical Roman figure, at the end of the Roman period in Britain, led away the troops from Britain. Uh, the native Welsh troops who had been incorporated into uh, the Roman administration of Britain leads them away to do battle, to try and protect his status, and thus opened the way for the quizzling British king, Gurtheirn, to admit the Saxons into the country to his aid. So essentially, this could be uh, a legendary account of an actually real historical situation, which is that Maximus, Maxim Ledig, leads the might of Britain out of the island onto the continent to serve his own political gains, essentially, leaving a power vacuum. Uh, and into that power vacuum steps this quizzling British or Brythonic uh, early Welsh king known as Gurtheirn. And Gurtheirn doesn't have many soldiers around him, doesn't have many warriors around him to support his, um, his rule. So he invites the Saxons, uh, the Germanic tribes over from the continent to work for him um, uh, as mercenaries essentially uh, and that's how the Saxons the early English get a foothold in Britain and thereby start colonizing uh, and taking over larger and larger portions of the south and the east of the island thereby as we know historically pushing the Welsh into what's now Wales this legendary account of the history of Britain that we find in the triads it's not historically accurate uh, in specific terms but it does convey the general story that archaeology and, and other historical sources confirm for us. So that's interesting because the general sweep, the general narrative of that history is accurately preserved in the triads and preserved from the time of the Roman occupation of Britain all the way through into the medieval period. Now this is where the contents of these trioid, of these triads, really comes into play. There's a reason why the bards preserved this ancient memory. There's a reason why they preserved the memory of Britain as one sovereign unit. They, there's a reason why they preserved names of legendary heroes specifically associated with that period great warriors of the past that stood against the Saxon incursion, if you like, that, that fought to preserve the idea of Britain as one sovereign island under Welsh rule. Now, this is a, obviously a very potent political idea uh, that would have appealed greatly to the Welsh nobility uh, uh, across the centuries. This idea that they were the rightful rulers of the island of Britain, that the crown of London was rightfully theirs, and that the English incomers uh, were nothing but usurpers, mercenaries uh, who had got above their station. It's very useful politically convenient narrative that serves the Welsh aristocracy quite well and may have elements of truth in it as I've just described. Now there's this very interesting triad in Triodhanus Prydain. It's the three fortunate concealments of the island of Britain. The first was the head of Bendigeidran, son of Llyr, which was concealed in the White Hill in London with its face towards France. And as long it was in the position in which it was put there, no Saxon oppression would ever come to this island. Now, of course, this is referring to that story that we find in the second branch of the Mabinogi, um, where Bendigeidran, Bran, who is the king, the overlord of Britain, marries his sister Branwen off to the Irish king. She's mistreated. The Welsh invade Ireland to rescue Branwen, Bendigeidran's sister, and then 
There's great carnage in Ireland and only seven return from Ireland. Ben de Gaedron, of course, being mortally wounded and requesting the seven companions to chop off his head uh, and to carry it to the White Hill in London. And along the way, they spend periods in Anoven in many ways. They spend uh, time in the time out of time. Uh, where they are entertained by the birds of Rhiannon and where Bran's severed head regales them uh, with fine conversation and stories and entertains them uh, as if they were at a, a dinner feast. So that whole story is referred to in the triads, uh, in this triad in particular, which gives us a hint at the detail contained potentially uh, behind each of the characters recorded in the triads which suggests how much we've lost if each of the characters had a story comparable to the second branch of the Mabinogi that is a vast body of lore and story that's gone missing now this triad also goes on to talk of the other fortunate concealments the second fortunate concealment the dragons in Dinas Emeris which Llyd son of Beli concealed for those of you wanting to explore that further you can go and read that story also Cyfran Llyd a Llyvelis which can be found in any good translation of the Mabinogion and the third the bones of Gwerthevir the Blessed another ancient king uh, of Britain in the chief ports of this island, so Gwerthevir requests that his bones are thrown into the chief ports of this island again, so as long as they remained in that concealment, no Saxon oppression would ever come to this island, exactly like uh, Bendigadran's head. Now, there is another triad, which is kind of the dark twin of this triad. Uh, instead of it being the three fortunate concealments, it's the three unfortunate uncoverings or revealings. Arthur goes and digs up Bendigaithran's head because he doesn't believe that the island of Britain should be protected by any might other than his own. Quite an arrogant thing to do for King Arthur. Uh, and then, of course, it's Gwrthairn who reveals Gwrthairn's bones in all the different ports, um, thereby... Uh, making the island prone to attack. Remember, uh, the triad mentions that no Saxon oppression would ever come to this island so long as Bendigaidran's head and Gwarthevir's bones were left alone. Now, this is interesting for several reasons. First of all, it suggests that this legend could have its roots all the way back in the Roman period. Uh, before the Saxons invaded, that perhaps there was a legendary king by the name of Bran or by the name of Gwerthevir who did give their body to protect the island of Britain. Perhaps there really was a severed head buried at the White Hill. Perhaps there really were bones thrown into the different ports of the island. It's the kind of thing that Celtic society in the Roman period may have done. We know that the Celts had a fascination with severed heads. We know that they did do particular things with bones. Um, it wouldn't be out of place for the Celts of Roman Britain to have behaved in that way. Now, there's no way of proving that. Um, it's merely a suggestion. But it, it at least preserves the idea of Britain without the English. The idea of Britain as a sovereign nation under the rule of the early Welsh. And not only that, but that that culture, that society, was protected by these different body parts. Now, the head of Bran the Blessed is interesting in that sense because, of course, the head, as well as perhaps being an actual historical artefact, is almost certainly a symbolic artefact also. The severed head that continues to speak in the second branch of the Mabinogi can be interpreted, for example, as a symbol for an oral tradition. 
something that is dead but that continues to speak a head that should be dead that continues to entertain that continues to create and take part in aristocratic culture yeah? it's an interesting image this idea of memory transcending death each successive generation literally inheriting the words of their predecessors and passing them on so it's interesting that that symbol in particular is evoked as a special magical protection for Britain not only for Britain but for the culture that sees itself as the rightful possessor of Britain i.e. the Welsh it's not only protecting the land, it's protecting the society and the culture and the language. So we can see that the triads aren't just offering a legendary account of Welsh culture. They're also evoking a particular mythology. They're evoking the mythology of Welsh aristocracy, how that aristocracy sought to protect uh, Britain, uh, how that aristocracy embodied in figures such as Bran and Gwerthevir became talismans, if you like, protecting uh, the Welsh and their land. So all this is um, very interesting. It's very potent stuff. Uh, it tells us a lot about Welsh culture at this time. There are other triads in the Welsh tradition, not just the Trioidonis Prydain, not just the triads of the island of Britain that commemorate this lost golden era of Welsh power. There's also triads that were used uh, to teach, not only triads for legal knowledge or medical knowledge, but also triads for poetic knowledge. And many of these triads um, are recorded in manuscripts from between the 14th and 16th century. Uh, one of the earliest manuscript copies was perhaps created by quite a famous Welsh uh, author by the name of Einion of Feiriad. And these are the type of triads that we find uh, in Gramadegair Penceirdiaid, the grammars of the chief bards, which do have prose sections, but also contains triads such as these. Three things that make a poem strong. Depth of meaning, regularity of Welsh, that means uh, grammatically correct Welsh, and excellence of imagination. So you can see this first triad is very good advice for any apprentice bard. It's obviously a training triad used to pass on the knowledge uh, of the poetic craft. Depth of meaning there is interesting. This notion that literature, poetry in particular, should have a depth. The surface ornamentation is one aspect of poetry. It should sound nice. Or uh, i'r galon is what we say in Wales, from the ear to the heart. It should sound pretty. Uh, it should sound musical, but it should also have a depth of meaning. This notion of uh, symbolic meaning, mythological meaning, is, is uh, one way of describing depth of meaning there. Excellence of imagination also, very important. And three things that make a poem weak. Vulgar imagination, shallow meaning, and a lack of Welsh. So a lack of grammatically correct language. If you don't have much of an imagination, or your imagination is crude, if you cannot create poetry that has depth, if all of your meanings are shallow, then you're going to be writing rubbish poetry. You're not going to be a very good bard. So again, sound advice. Three things a poem likes. Clear declamation, clearly performed. Skillful construction, so the, the poetic art itself. And the authority of the bard very important this notion of presence of having authority as you step up in the court to perform your poetry of praise or perhaps commemoration for the fallen in front of the aristocracy that you should have authority uh, they need to trust in your uh, inherent power uh, as a bard that's essentially what gives us the figure of Taliesin of course Taliesin being uh, an authoritative, powerful, uh, wise uh, embodiment of the Welsh bardic tradition. Uh, if you uh, had an opportunity to look at any of the poems in the book of Taliesin, you'll see that uh, he's quite a confident, if not arrogant and cocksure character, the Taliesin that we find there. 
three things a poem does not like feeble declamation vulgar imagination and the dishonor of the bard so make sure that you work to preserve your authority that you have honor and integrity three things that make a when for a bard so the the actual uh, spiritual power of the welsh bards there a when what makes a when for the apprentice bard is genius essentially means natural talent and practice so practicing the craft of poetry and art so you need some natural ability you need to be trained in the actual uh, craft of poetry how to create these elegantly wrought poems with strict syllabic counts and different types of alliteration and rhyme end rhyme and internal rhyme um, uh, how to use these pulsing rhythms of the tradition to create these very grandiose performances and it's interesting that that's an important aspect of our when that pure natural talent isn't enough on its own that you also need the other components which is training uh, in an actual craft and the ability to combine those two things and create an, an art if you like an art form I just go on to look at some more triads three things that impoverish a bard's awen drunkenness lustfulness and criticism three essentials for a bard liveliness of speech when declaiming a poem and meditating upon poetic art to ensure it is not faulty and the boldness of his answer to what he is asked so quite similar to the other triad that we looked at there the ability to perform poetry and to have presence on stage, if you like, is is one of the key things a bard must have. But it's this last triad that I really want to pay attention to. Three things that make a bard consistent or regular in their ability to create poetry. What makes a bard inspired? What ensures a bard is consistently in touch with Awen? And interestingly, the first thing is the telling of tales. So storytelling as a way of ensuring a bard is consistently inspired. Engaging with stories as a way of ensuring the bard has an active imagination. I find that very interesting because, of course, in... The Magic of Meaning course that I often run, where we discuss uh, the deeper mythology of the four branches of the Mabinogi, for example. Discussing and talking through the stories does spark the imagination. It does give us some inspiration. It does cause the awen to flow, if you like, to engage with stories on a deep level, to understand the intricacies of narrative, to look at what myths and symbols are evoked in story. So it's interesting that that's one of uh, the pieces of advice that the Bardic masters gave to their apprentices, which was, look, if you want to be consistently inspired, to be able to consistently produce fine art, then use the stories, tell the stories, know the stories well. Refer to the trioi is pradain, to the triads of storytelling, the triads of the island of Britain. They will uh, evoke in you the legendary traditions of the Welsh. Yeah? Of course, it's not only the telling of tales, but poetry. Be familiar with the poetry of your contemporaries. Engage with poetry as you find it in the tradition uh, that surrounds you. But also the old poetry, Hengerd in particular. So turn to the works of the ancient masters. Turn to the works of Taliesin and Aneirin uh, and various of the other uh, bards uh, whose works are now lost to us. Look at this ancient poetry uh, and let it inspire you. To move on to an earlier period uh, in the Celtic tradition, we can, of course, go back to the Roman period. So it's difficult to say whether triads, as we understand them, as these mnemonics for uh, indexing traditional law, whether they were actually part of Brythonic culture at the time. Um, we can only guess that that was the case. But the number three did have obvious 
spiritual and quasi-magical properties uh, in the Celtic or Romano-Celtic culture uh, of Roman Britain. Uh, and we find that obviously expressed in the triple deities. Uh, perhaps one of the more obvious is the triple goddess altar that was found at Coventine as well, perhaps from the second century AD. These may not actually be goddesses, but they're certainly spirits or divinely potent female figures associated with water. If you look closely at each of them, you can see that it's as if they're half sub submerged in water. The artist has clearly conveyed water rippling around uh, the lower parts of their bodies. And they also have these vessels. One vessel, of course, is pouring water out, uh, obviously into the well. And they're also holding vessels up. Water itself carries the whole notion of a source. So these were perhaps the, the three female spirits guarding the source uh, of this special sacred water. I think it's difficult to say that these were definitely goddesses in, in the way that we conceive of goddesses. I often think that the whole notion of a Romano-Celtic goddess perhaps borrows more from the Roman conception of what a goddess is than it did from the Celtic conception of what, what a goddess is. That's because, as I uh, discussed last week, the whole notion of an other world in Celtic culture doesn't really correspond that well with the notion of an other world in Christian, early Christian or classical uh, continental culture. The other world of the Welsh and the Irish, at least, were obviously quite different spaces. So I would say that that also suggests that perhaps goddesses or divinities were thought of as slightly differently. Perhaps they were more like um, local spirits, um, uh, spirits of place more than gods and goddesses in a separate heaven. Um, so that might be what we find here uh, in this image uh, at Coventina as well. Coventina, of course, was actually a Romano-Celtic goddess, but again it's unclear if she was more of a Roman goddess than a Celtic spirit of place who was called Coventina. It's difficult to tease these things out, but I'm trying to suggest the nuances of the position in Romano-Celtic culture there. Of course, this is quite a, a typical piece of Romano-Celtic iconography. It blends Celtic and Roman influences. Uh, it's quite naturalistic in some senses, borrowing on the classical tradition of, of actually imitating nature. But the faces are Celtic in some regards. The eyes in particular have a, a Celtic style to them. But of course, there are images of purely Celtic divinity. This is the triple goddess or a triple female spirits found at Bath, uh, perhaps from the first century uh, BC. This is clearly a purely Celtic carving. This is not naturalistic in any sense. It's abstracted in many ways. It's very different to the classical tradition of imitating nature. And these again are female uh, divine spirits or figures associated with water. And it's not the case that every triple goddess or figure is associated with water, but many of them are. Uh, triplism, of course, is a feature of many deities in the Celtic tradition. We've got many triple gods, many triple goddesses that have nothing to do with water. But I find this association of threes with water in particular very interesting. We find evidence of other threes associated with water also. The image that I use as the branding for Celtic source, for example. This is a triple spiral plaque that was found on the slopes of Cadridris, perhaps uh, made about 100 years BC. Uh, it's from a, a hoard known as the Talathin Hoard, and it was a hoard that was found essentially under a rock on the path uh, 
up towards Talashin Lake. Um, and Talashin Lake perhaps was one of these uh, mountain tarns that were used uh, as a place of worship for the Celts. It could be the case that what we find in the Talashin Hoard are artifacts that were used for some kind of ceremony held at the lake. So this idea of threes again associated with water. I'm not saying that all triple spirals and all triple goddesses are necessarily associated with water, but we know that the Celts had a great uh, reverence and respect for watery places. They would give many offerings to water. What I'm suggesting there is that perhaps three as a magic number had some association not just with water, but with this idea of a source. The reason why I'm making that suggestion, and bear in mind I could never prove this explicitly, but it's this idea that three as a magical number is the number of magical sources. Not just the magical source of water coming out of the ground, as we find suggested with that triple spiral plaque found close to the lake on Cadridris, or those uh, triple goddesses or female spirits associated with water sources, but also this idea of a triad being a source of wisdom, of the three drops of magical elixir that gave Guion Bach uh, his magical enlightenment. This idea of triads of special knowledge being sources of inspiration, that triad there uh, suggesting that Welsh bards should go and study uh, stories, should go and tell stories, learn stories, which they would find organised and indexed in the Welsh triads. So all of this traditional learning that would have given inspiration, uh, enabled the, uh, the bard to touch Awen, if you like, they are organised in threes. These are literally special magical sources uh, associated very closely with the magical number three. Now that's just a theory. Uh, I could never prove that beyond bringing these disparate pieces of evidence together and presenting them uh, in a certain light. <laughs>